inner quest explores various pathways through which you can connect with the infinite wisdom of the universe and apply it to personal, professional, and spiritual growth. This program, featuring accomplished practitioners, educators, and authors, is provided by Infinity Foundation, an innovative center for holistic studies and research. We invite you to share this journey with us. Hello, welcome to InnerQuest. My name is Jay Stone, your host for today, and our guest is Ellen Katz. Welcome, Ellen. Hi, nice to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about Ellen. Ellen is a licensed psychotherapist in California, Illinois. Ellen has over 30 years of experience. She is also a lead singer in the spiritual Kirtan band called uh, Bhakti Caravan. Perfectly said. And uh, if we can get a shot over here, uh, you've got this musical instrument, and uh, we've enticed you to play later. So, uh, a little give, sample? Yeah, give our audience uh, um, a little tease to keep them interested. But you are teaching a class at Infinity, and it's about epiphanies. So you can, can you tell our audience what is an epiphany? So an epiphany is a big word for an aha experience. Kind of like a big, yeah, <laughs> like the big, like, what? Wow, I get it. And I think everyone has had one, or many, many epiphanies. But, you know, when I was doing that just now, like, what? I, I just realized that probably, you know, even when you're a kid and you don't get it, you just don't get algebra, you don't get algebra, you don't get algebra, and one day it's like, I get it, it was so easy. So something switches in the brain. Mm -hmm. But if I could put it in, like, the simplest terms. An epiphany is a spontaneous event. It can't be controlled, it can't be forced to happen, mm -hmm. but it is a shift in perspective where your consciousness and your mind suddenly put the pieces together differently and, un and it increases your understanding because of the shift in perspective. Okay, all of a sudden everything transforms. This is if you're looking at a puzzle and you see all those pieces and all of a sudden you see how they fit together. Mm -hmm. the, somehow, both the conscious mind and the unconscious mind come together to integrate to where those pieces that seem so disconnected are suddenly connected. Well, uh, can you tell our audience maybe some of your clients' epiphanies or your students' epiphanies without revealing? Well, actually, you know what? I'm going to share a, an epiphany of my own. Mm -hmm. um, those were, there are moments in my life, and I wonder if, if, if I share this with you, Jay, or anybody else, if, if I share my story, if that would sort of um, instigate a memory for you. And one story for me was uh, when many years ago I was a, a keynote speaker at a conference, and it was, there were about 500 people in the audience, and I was pretty young, I think now, okay? At the time, I didn't think so. And I had, a lot of, I had a lot of anxiety, getting up there in front of this big group. And in the very front row was Gerald Ford and his wife. <laughs> this was at the part, it was near the Betty Ford Center. I consulted there at the time. And uh, there were a lot of folks around. And was I this in after California. he was the president? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it was, I'm just saying that to, not to, to drop names, but to tell you what it felt like for little old 30-something-year-old Ellen to get up and try to do a keynote introduction at this point. I was very nervous. And I'm walking over to the, whatever, the podium. And um, as I'm getting there, literally quaking in my boots, I hear what felt like a voice in my head. Now, some people might say that was the voice of the divine and an angel or who knows what. And frankly, it does not matter. What matters is that I heard that voice. And uh, the, the message simply was, these are children in adult bodies, and they need what you have to say. Don't be selfish. Okay, so all of a sudden, my entire view of what was going on completely shifted from little old me and seeing this audience as huge and powerful and scary to seeing all these adults as children in adult bodies, and everything shifted. My anxiety went away. I felt compassion for them. And my message was available at that point. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? 
Yes. Well, let me tell you about my experience. Good, if and, I want to hear. Uh, and let me know if I had an Excuse epiphany me. or not. Sure. I was driving down Highway 41, and I got pulled over by a North Chicago police officer for speeding, and uh, the officer let me go. And the next day, I was talking to my neighbor, who's a police officer, and I said, you know, I got pulled over for speeding, but, um, you know, the officer let me go. I said, but I don't know why I was so nervous. I wasn't afraid about getting a ticket or going to jail. And then the following day, I realized what had happened, um, or I made a connection that I never made mm -hmm. before. I had an older sister who had passed away, mm -hmm. and I was quite young. I was like three years old. And it was a, a police officer who had come to my parents and the rest of the family to tell uh, the news. family the, the news about my sister's death. And so I was able to connect this fear of uh, mm -hmm. a, a policeman. Even my neighbor, if, if he'd stop over and he was in uniform, I'd get nervous. And, and I'd after get, you had that, that recognition, did you feel differently? Well, I felt uh, the grace of God. Um, and, you know, it just helped me to understand. I know if I get pulled over That's again by a, know. A, yeah. a policeman, I probably would be nervous, but at least I'd know why I'd be nervous. Well, that's a really good observation because knowing why you're nervous changes the way you look at it. Uh, that's true with anything. You have foreground and you have background, okay? So if we look at this harmonium just sitting there, it means nothing. But if we say this is an instrument that's going to be played later on, it's going to be part of a demonstration, it gives us a context. You have a context for understanding your response now. And yeah. so then the, the, the feeling of fear doesn't have to be so undoing, as it were. Or, or un, uncontrolled. So, um, but would you consider that an epiphany? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think that fits the definition. It wasn't something that you forced. No. It's something that happened spontaneously where you put pieces together and then you it, it shifted your understanding. The way I usually explain this to my clients is if imagine that you're lost in a city, not like Chicago, because Chicago is so perfectly you know, designed with everybody's proud of the way that the grid it's system. The perfect. Yeah. But, but one time I was lost in a city in southern China. And there are cities that have no order to them whatsoever, as I'm sure everybody knows. And so the, the streets are all winding and in patterns that don't make any particular sense, at least to the person who's walking around if you've never been there. Now, if you imagine that, that feeling of being lost and going around corners and looking and not seeing anything familiar and feel the anxiety that would begin to build for a person who really, especially if you can't speak the language, and then you imagine what it would be like if someone took you by the hand and said, come, come with me, someone who looked safe enough, and took you to the top of a very high building. And from the top of this building, you can begin to see the landmarks that mm -hmm. you're familiar with. Okay, there, way over there is my hotel, or there's the river, or there's whatever. All of a sudden, from that shift in perspective, you now have an understanding of where you are in relation to everything else. That's the second order shift, which is essentially what an epiphany is. A second order shift in awareness or consciousness. So the, 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 f the first order shift would be going through the streets. Yes. And then the second order shift would be an in interpretation. The first order shift would be if I was standing with you in the middle of all that maze and said, Jay, it's really no big deal. You just three steps do this way and four steps that way. And you're going, I, I can't picture it. The minute you can picture it. If I said to you, oh, don't worry about it, Jay, that, that issue with, with policemen, it just has something to do with your childhood. That didn't do it for you. You had yeah. to put those pieces together spontaneously. That, that memory came, and you weren't trying. Right. And that was, that's a really key piece to this, is learning how to be, just to be, and allow something to, to manifest as being. Well, I think what helped me was that I asked the question, you yeah. know, why, why do I get so nervous around policemen? I, I, had, I had no, f no reason to fear getting a ticket or getting arrested, so I just asked the question. And I think that willingness is a, is a really nice and subtle piece of the, of the equation because it was, it was the willingness to be taught or to be shown. Just like I'm sure Einstein was willing to be shown before he could figure out the theory of relativity, but he didn't figure it out. It came to him. Mm -hmm. And that's the, what, the way it is with an epiphany or an aha experience or a second order shift. It comes to you. Well, and... Uh, 
Einstein is famous for saying imagination is more important than facts. Uh, do you think imagination is important to having an epiphany? No, I really don't. I mean, I think you can have somebody that is so locked into being concrete and practical and overthinking that they can stop such a thing from happening. But when you think of imagination, like people who are very imaginative can come up with creative stories. And, you know, and, and I don't think you have to be that imaginative to have an aha experience. Yeah. I think you have to be those other things, willing, like you sort of alluded to. Um, and to learn, and that's what we'll talk about in the class I'm teaching at Infinity, um, to learn how to stop trying. Because, wow, that's all we've ever been taught. Try some more, try some more, try some more. How do you, what happens when you stop? Can you stand it? Can you learn how to be with yourself? Can you make space? Can you allow for it? You made space with your question, for example. Mm -hmm. You said, why is this? But that was an open-ended question, you yeah. know? made room for an answer to come. Well, um, getting back to that second order, and let's see if I understand it correctly, or how it could be beneficial. So let's say, to use your example of being in a city and having that second order shift, so that in the future, when you're in a congested and chaotic, uh, chaotically laid out city, you can go, oh, okay. You know, I was here in China and, and did it. I can do it here. You're, you're bringing something else up that I think is really important. It's not as much involved, as, as you know, as the epiphany itself, but it's then how do I use that in my life? How do I apply what I've learned? Because a lot of people have had aha experiences, and then they kind of lose it because hmm. the mundane kind of life stressors take over, right? So it's like, how do I keep that alive? I think a lot of people want to know that, like people who've had, you know, terminal illnesses and, or lived through it or near-death experiences. And it's like, I want to keep what I just learned and what I experienced with me. How do I do that? So that's another piece of this. You know, you've already made a commitment to yourself. I, you know that you want to apply that knowledge every time. Now, is the epiphany different than, let's say, a religious or peak experience or transcendent experience that Abraham Maslow talked about? I would think so. Because, for example, yours, though it felt spiritual in nature, um, it, was, it was very practical. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I, you know, why am I scared of being confronted by a policeman? And, it, and, it's, and I, I could even more detail, it, a policeman in uniform. In uniform. Like my neighbor, when he's not in uniform, and I've got There's many nothing. friends who are police officers, and I'd be at parties. Sure. There might be 20, 30 police officers. So it's not the fact that they're policemen. It's when they show up in that uniform, which is the visual cue. Eye. Yeah. Yeah. So what we know is probably in your situation, you went into shock, an emotional shock at that moment, and some things get locked down when we go into shock. Um, and the amygdala, the part of the brain that, you know, as you know, um, really retains memory is not necessarily retaining fact. It's retaining what it, it can collect from around itself and that an emotion of terror, mm -hmm. of shock. We, we need to, as one of my friends says, defrag the amygdala. amygdala. We need to re-educate it to have a new association, which is what you essentially did. Now, that is a perfect example of applying an aha experience. Good. Don't I, I don't want to test it anymore and get pulled over. <laughs> I don't <didn't> think so. <laughs> yeah, no, get pulled over. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the other benefits to epiphanies? Well, I think, I'm, I'm guessing that probably everybody sort of wants to have that. I, mean, I don't know that it's, um, I don't think there's it's much controversy around it. Uh, I think the real question is, how do we enhance the possibility to have that? And, and I think your example was so great. It was like the openness to it, the willingness. I remember years ago when I, um, I was really frustrated because I wanted to feel a connection with God. And I, I lived in the desert at the time. I lived in Palm Springs. And I literally was wandering the desert. And I was thinking, I don't know what to, I, what's wrong with me. I don't, I don't have that. And then I just put it out there as a question. I admitted my truth. My truth was, I don't feel God. I don't feel it. I want to, but I don't feel it. And so I said, it. I don't know why I don't feel it. If there's anything 
sorry, I don't feel you. If you're out there, uh, whatever you are, I don't feel it. But if you're there, I'm willing. So I think there's a surrender piece, too. A mm. surrender to control, to trying so hard. There's something antithetical about trying. So if we're really wanting to change something in our life, I think, unfortunately, the over-trying approach has been proven to not be real successful. You know? well, well, to support what you said, um, in m my case, I think the mind that asked the question, why I'm afraid of a police officer, isn't the mind that answered the question. Beautiful, beautiful. And it was a, a higher self. Right. Uh, and sometimes it's about um, a willingness to just go away from that conscious mind. And I'm not necessarily saying to go into trance, or maybe, and you know more about this than I do, m maybe a light level of a trance is what we're kind of talking about, where you're just very, very relaxed, mm -hmm. you're trying too hard. Um, but sometimes just learning how to go there um, mm -hmm. I had an experience just yesterday where I went into a nice, light, light, relaxed state and somebody was gently reminding me about, just asking me questions about um, what was going on with my mom and dad when, I, when my mom was pregnant with me. And because I was in that relaxed state and my conscious mind wasn't working so hard, I was able to just see things and put things together. So that, I think, maybe as a hypnotherapist, you see that a lot. Um, there's... Um, also, a story I wanted to share with you, and I'll try to make this very brief. When I was um, 34 years old, I was a cancer survivor, and I also had never had a child. And at the time, um, this was a big deal. My husband had a reverse vasectomy. I went to get pregnant. The doctors finally gave me the green light, and um, uh, they said I could get pregnant. Well, it sounds a little graphic, but I don't really care. I tell the story to lots of people. Um, the day came, I was ovulating, and, you know, we did what we needed to do to get pregnant. And um, I was at a hypnotherapy conference at the time. Now, back to hypnosis and trance and epiphany, I do think there's a relationship here. Um, and the, the important part about this story is I went into this little trance, and I'm thinking, because remember, I'm a cancer survivor. I'm thinking white blood cells and all that stuff. But I'm equating the sperm to the white blood cells, and I'm going, come on, you guys, you can do it. You can do it to the sperm. Again, I have this little voice in my head, an answer. And the answer says, what are you doing? Ellen, you have nothing to do with those guys. You've got to relate to that. So it was like, just like there's a camera, and my head goes like this. And I see this egg. Now, mind you, I'm a 34-year-old type A personality. And it's showing me an egg. And I'm supposed to relate to an egg. There's no part of me that related to an egg. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line, the epiphany was, if I couldn't learn how to just be, if I couldn't learn how to really reconnect with that divine feminine within me, with all of the incredible aspects of the feminine, there was no way I was going to get pregnant. Okay, I don't know if you can follow that, but that was a huge epiphany for me. Well, and it, 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 it turned out to be sure I got pregnant right then, that moment, at that second. And, um, and how old is your child now? 23. Okay, mm -hmm. so now everyone knows how old I am. Right. So that was, a, that was an example. But again, not trying. The trying, trying, trying to get pregnant, no. The relaxing, the letting go, the going, oh, I get it. I need to learn how to be here, a be a receiving, open presence and in this do you, life. Do you think that being uh, receptive and open has kept you healthy and stopped the cancer from coming back? Oh, yeah. Well, you, and you described yourself back then at 34 as a type A. You, d you don't strike me as a type A no, person. I don't think I am. I think I'm a different human being completely. And would you attribute the difference, uh, your maturation and development, as a result of a series of epiphanies um, that made you better and better? Let's put it this way. When I w I'd already started, I did a lot of self-inquiry early on, but when I was in the hospital after my surgery, and anybody who's ever been in the hospital, I think, can re relate if you've spent the night there. The night after your surgery is kind of a little bit of a daunting time. It's You're alone, and all these things. It doesn't matter if you have negative associations with the hospital or not. And in that moment, um, I just was dedicated to making this a learning experience for myself. So I think 
again, it all depends on your attitude. When you go into something, your willingness, when you see something or you confront something that is potentially scary or challenging or evocative or triggering, to go into it with a willingness to say, there has got to be something in here that can bring me even to a higher level, to a higher level of functioning or consciousness. Now, Ellen, I was on your website uh, today, and I, mm -hmm. I believe I read on your website that your family is uh, Holocaust survivors? Yeah, my mom's side, right. Yeah, and uh, have you had any epiphanies regarding the uh, Holocaust and, you know, your uh, ancestors? Uh, That's a really, really, really deep question and a big question. Um, as far as the epiphanies, I may have but I don't know that I'm conscious of them. The, the thing that hit me, and then this, I guess, only belongs on this show, <laughs> when my same daughter, that's now 23, was about three and a half, because she knew about the Holocaust, because it was something that was discussed in our family. Um, I, I, I was talking, we were in a conversation, and there were more than a few of us there, and she, I said, well, I wasn't, I wasn't around then. I wasn't born during the war. I was born after the war. And she pipes up and she says, no, you, you were there, Mommy. And I'm like, no, no, Rachel, I wasn't there. She says, no, no, you were there, and I was too. And I, she was talking like an old woman. And um, I said, oh, yeah? And then I just decided to, to trick her or test her or something. And I said, so what color were the gas chambers? She, she looked at it and she goes, they were green. And then I remember, like a few years later, I, we went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and we, looked, we were there at the replicas, and they were all that color. Wow. So I don't know. That's not an epiphany, but it, it opens us up to the possibilities of that there are so much more out there. And I'm sure you talk to people all the time about this. And I think if, if we were to summarize this at all, it would be just to stay open because there right. are probably a lot more possibilities for me if I start to ask the questions. I maybe just haven't asked the questions. Well, I, I, I believe that if we close parts of our mind, our, our bodies reflect what the mind's doing, then parts of our bodies close up, which will create stress and tension and inhibit uh, the normal blood circulation and True. cause illness or injury. And we don't uh, even know that we've closed our minds off. That's the right. interesting thing. Because the, our, our egos are so in love with themselves. I think it's a good time to play some music, lighten things up. And uh, Is there anything you'd like to say about this uh, musical This is a harmonium. I wish you guys could see the, the front of it. It's a little bit different. Um, you, can, you can change the key in this little keyboard by moving it a little bit one way or the other. And um, so, in other words... For those people who are musicians, if you can always play in the key of C, but you could change it by just moving the keyboard. I'll show you a little bit like that. Ah. Okay. And how did you get started playing this instrument? Well, when I lived in California, I, I became very involved um, with a yoga studio, actually, and a swami who was um, starting that yoga studio. And he was a wonderful teacher. And part of what we did was we sang with him, and he played the harmonium. And um, it just was, I, I was a musician early on in my life, and it just went on and on and on from there. But when I came here, um, I have been following a teacher named Amrita Nanda Maima, or Ama. And if you go, she's a humanitarian, a wonderful person. And uh, I just started singing with that group a lot, and then we started our own. Did so. you ever sing with Krishna Das? I've sung with Krishna Das, not on the stage, but I've sung with Krishna Das many times. Yeah, yeah. I, I love his music. Okay, so now you know Kirtan. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and then you also do this for Infinity as well, I don't do. you? I um, do. We have a little band named Bhakti Caravan, and for the last couple of years we've been coming there um, to Infinity Foundation to, to teach chanting and to, to do a little bit of a fundraiser for the Infinity Foundation. So I, I welcome everyone to come. And we have them pretty regularly. And what does bhakti caravan ah, mean? Good question. Well, bhakti is a Sanskrit word. And bhakti is a type of yoga, actually. Mm -hmm. Because yoga does not just mean doing asanas, doing positions. Yoga is, is a multi, multifaceted formula for living and for consciousness. And bhakti is the joy of devotion, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
So bhakti essentially says, if I start chanting, which I will in a minute, you will see me go into a light trance almost immediately. And you will also be able to tell that I'm pretty joyous. Hmm. Now, should I tell you a little bit about kirtan? Do you yeah. have a second? Oh, um, I'm getting a, a sign. It's like, go ahead, play your running, running out of time. So running out of time. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, kirt a, a little chant to, to the guru. But in kirtan, what we do is we kind of um, sing back and forth. So I lead a little line, and then you would sing an, a line back. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Param Brahma, Taz my Shri Guru Venamaha, Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu. Guru Devo Maheshwara Guru Sakshat Haram Brahma Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha that's a little example. Now the, the thing about playing kirtan is that we usually start out slow, we get fast and we build up and there's a lot of energy and it's really exciting and then we come back. So it's a meditation. We're chanting the names of the divine and basically my last sentence on it is the actual words in Sanskrit because it's a very ancient language are in themselves transformative just like with you know when you have the gong bath and when you have you hear different sounds these are all sounds that Ancient. uplift. Oh, very, yeah, yeah. And um, I know you might ask someone, well, how many minutes a day do you meditate, or et cetera, but how often do you, you play your instrument? Not as much as I want. I have a full-time psychotherapy practice, but um, I do it a lot. It's out in my living room, and my partner is a bass player in the band, and singing is, is meditation for me, so I probably chant a lot. Did, have you ever brought this in, uh, your, your well, office? At Interbalance in Northbrook, yeah. We do sometimes do, um, do uh, various types of kirtan and chanting with harmonium, but um, I teach meditation also, and I don't usually use this. I usually use recorded music or uh, tambura. Have you ever heard of Will Tuttle? No. Oh, well, um, he, he used to teach uh, philosophy, and, and he's a pianist, and so... He always kept a piano in his class, and he used it as a, a teaching instrument. Well, my first job was a music therapist. Oh. And I had a piano, and I would do guided meditation while I was improvising. So I totally get what you're saying. This, this little guy, this is more like a drone to create atmosphere in the background. It, it, so. It's beautiful. Thank um, you. I know churches, they use organs. Uh-huh. Um, also read instruments, yeah. Yeah. All right. Got to get a signal to wrap it up. Well, I really hope you guys will come to some kirtan at Infinity. Keep looking for it because we do them regularly and everything, all proceeds go to the Infinity Foundation. Okay. And uh, until next time, we wish you good health, good spirits, and good fortunes. Thank you so much. Thank this show, our guests, Infinity Foundation, or any of our other programs, please visit our website, infinityfoundation.org, or call us at 847-831-8828.